There's actually a trick to avoid the daytime, uh, the afternoon crash. It's not a trick, it's biology. But there's just absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. Don't ingest caffeine for the first 90 minutes or so. It seems like what he's stating is peer-reviewed proven fact, but no, there's no research supporting what he's saying at all. Then you drink caffeine, and what you'll find is that if normally you would crash around 2 or 3 in the afternoon, you don't experience that crash anymore. Mm. I can only imagine the amount of people that are following this protocol around the world and don't know that it's actually not backed by any genuine science. Because the caffeine wears off, but there isn't a lot of adenosine there to bind the receptor. The first time I saw this, I just completely took Huber Daddy at his word for it. I have a neuroscience degree, and everything made complete sense to me. But even more than that is the confidence in which he states this. Andrew Huberman has gained a great deal of his fame from going on these different podcasts and talking about these overly simplistic protocols. And again, with such confidence and rapport and credentials that you just believe him at his word. I am sorry. I just thought some of these were too funny. I mean, they're obviously all clickbait making massively overblown claims. But check this one out. It literally looks like Huber Daddy is Jesus himself coming down from the heavens to save us all and this one it only takes one day come on nothing meaningful happens in one day okay okay let's get into one of the major podcast claims he's become famous for and why it's a bunch of nonsense study that was published in the european journal of physiology that showed these huge increases in dopamine two to three x above baseline the biggest effect is a big increase 2.5 x increase in dopamine that lasts for several hours. And then the fact that the dopamine increases are huge and long lasting. I mean, they're like 2.5 X increases creates that long arc of dopamine. The increases in this case are lasting many hours, two to four to even six hours. Arc of dopamine release that's quite long lasting. There's no question. I mean, what you can like feel it in your body. I won't go into all the details of that video. You'll have to watch it after this one. But long story short, there is no evidence at all that dopamine increases in the brain following a cold plunge. A fact that Rhonda Patrick was forced to admit after she got bombarded by a crazy amount of neuroscientists on X who were pointing out her very basic physiological flaw. But luckily enough, Rhonda Patrick is a high integrity scientific communicator and she took down all of the videos. Oh wait, no, that's actually not what she did at all. She continues to spread that garbage misinformation and she blocked me for pointing it out. In another instance, he got absolutely shredded by the cannabis community for his video on the same psychoactive substance. He's also made multiple videos about growth mindset, which has been shown in very large studies to really have no effect. I spoke to Dr. Kevin Mitchell about this on my podcast. But it was all part of the kind of um, the replication crisis that hit psychology first, probably especially social psychology, where there were lots of things like this, you know, where it's growth mindset or power posing or, or whatever it is. Yeah. The idea we talked a little bit earlier, where, you know, some brief intervention, the, the mind training things are the same, right? So brief intervention here makes some huge difference to your life, right? Uh, but the really, really big studies have just uh, failed to replicate any sort of these, the, the, what I call the magic effects, right? The ones that are really incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's just unbelievable, right? That that short an intervention would have this big effect, well, you know, on somebody's life. Um, and again, I guess the idea of, well, what happens in the next 10 minutes or the next hour uh, or the, you know, the two weeks after you do the, the, the growth mindset thing every day for two weeks or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's inherently, to me, uh, kind of just uh, unlikely. And then the data, we know the methodology that were that showed the positive effects were from small studies and not well corrected and so on. And then the methodology from big studies and meta analyses that's better done shows no effect. So, you know, my conclusion is there's no effect. Yeah. Um, and yet we keep hearing about it. And yeah. of course, the thing is, like, I don't mind like telling people, uh, you know, talk like this to your kids. It's great. But usually, and I don't know if this was the case in, in the video that Andrew um, Huberman posted there. Uh, but oftentimes the, the growth mindset TM, right, that comes with a price tag. It's yeah. like that's the program you pay for. Right? Yeah. Those are the books. Those are million dollars. I mean, those are best selling books, right? Based yeah. on, uh, on those kinds of paradigms. And online so, course. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, um, again, you know, someone's making money. Someone's making money out of these claims. So we have established that Andrew Huberman in the past has pushed some pretty dodgy science, science-based tools for everyday life. 
but I haven't heard anyone dive into his coffee protocol. And when I did, the result really blew me away. In fact, many people find that if they delay their caffeine intake to 90 to 120 minutes after waking up, that they feel more alert in the morning and they completely avoid that afternoon crash. I thought this part was very strange. Many people experience the benefits of not crashing in the late afternoon. Who are many people? I mean, he's obviously not quoting or referencing a study directly here. Are these just humans' friends? Because that's irrelevant. That's not good data. That's very ascientific. Is he just telling this protocol to his friends and then they're going back to him and saying, yeah, I didn't get a crash in the evening. If I was Andrew Huberman's friend, I would do the exact same. I mean, this isn't good data. People don't, or scientists don't sit down and say, I have great data. I told all my friends about it and it works. So who are these people? I just thought that was strange. By delaying caffeine intake from to 90 to 120 minutes after waking, there are a couple of things that are accomplished. First of all, you offset that afternoon crash. And this is an effect that many people experience the very first time they start delaying their caffeine intake. To Who is many people? Again, I never, I never hear neuroscientists just say many people. You either reference a study, you be more specific about who those people are so you can give some credential or reputation to what you're saying. But when do you ever hear a neuroscientist say some people, many people experience this benefit but be so vague about who those people are? It's just so strange. I mean, no neuroscientists talk this way. 90 to 120 minutes after waking. And the reason this works so well is the following. Finally getting into a reasoning, let's go. As I mentioned earlier, adenosine is a molecule that builds up the longer that we are awake. It is a molecule that is reduced or cleared from our system by sleep. So when we emerge from sleep, regardless of how long we've slept, our adenosine levels are lower than they were when we went to sleep the previous night. If you Fact. slept well enough and long enough, those adenosine levels can be very, very low, but they are never completely zero. As I mentioned earlier, there is a way to clear out the adenosine that's present when you wake up in the morning. This is the interesting part. And to clear it out essentially completely. Remember this, essentially completely is what he's saying. So there is a way to clear out that residual adenosine essentially completely this part is really crucial without just blocking its receptors and letting it accumulate or hang around and the way to do that is to deliberately spike your cortisol get something done outside even if it's just to get outside and get bright light in your eyes why well because it's been shown in studies on humans that getting bright light in your eyes in the first hour after waking or as soon as possible after waking increases the peak of that cortisol pulse by 50 percent five zero and that cortisol pulse yes increases mood yes increases alertness but it does one other very important thing which is that that through an indirect pathway it can clear out any residual adenosine that might be present in your system when you wake up in the morning so here's the crucial part where I think Andrew Huberman is connecting mechanistic dots that do not exist. He states that getting that bright light in your eyes increases your cortisol awakening response. I found the study he's talking about and it does say 50% increase even though he doesn't cite it himself. There is also other studies I found that showed that that increase in cortisol awakening response is maybe not as conclusive as he lays out here, but let's for the sake of argument assume he's correct. You do have a greater cortisol awakening response upon waking if you get out and you get bright light into your eyes. His crucial argument, which is key to this whole protocol and trick that he calls it, is that this cortisol spike is clearing out adenosine. He makes it seem like this cortisol is an adenosine vacuum cleaner and it's just clearing it all out. If you remember, essentially completely is the words that he uses. There is a way to clear out the adenosine that's present when you wake up in the morning and to clear it out essentially completely. Again, when you state something with such confidence, you assume that there is an exact study online which shows adenosine concentrations in a human brain following a cortisol awakening response in somebody who has got bright light in their eye. There is not only no study which shows that cortisol clears adenosine, but there is nothing online at all which would even indicate that that would be the case. He does say an indirect pathway, but 
what does he mean by that? Because I can't find any linking of cortisol and any of the mechanisms and pathways that clear adenosine. This piece of logic is core to his whole protocol. And again, it seems like what he's stating is peer reviewed proven fact, but no, there's no research supporting what he's saying at all. There's no information, there's no data, there's nothing at all supporting what Andrew Huberman is stating. So I don't even understand the mechanistic logical grounds that Huberman is making this connection. But what I do know is that there's no direct evidence to support what he's saying. Other ways to increase that cortisol peak would be to do some physical activity. If you don't have time to do a full workout, well then getting some movement, you know, 10 minutes of skipping rope or even five minutes of skipping rope or jumping jacks or walking if that's all you have time for, ideally while getting the sunlight in your eyes. But that's going to zero out the adenosine present in your system. Zero out the adenosine present in your system. Where is he getting this? I mean, none of the studies that he references in his description are anything related to this. And there's a reason for that because no study exists. But this is something that's been shown and proven many, many times. Exercise does not clear out adenosine. Exercise absolutely increases adenosine. Again, another fact that is verifiable on consensus.ai, which I have absolutely no affiliation for, but is a brilliant tool for debunking your overly confident, overly pompous neuroscientist. It actually links to a direct study which shows that exercise increases adenosine levels in the brain. And that's the mechanism by which exercise helps us fall asleep. He's kind of just meshed these two protocols together and given absolutely no supporting evidence for one, but kind of just shoving loads of mechanism in related to sunlight because that's where his brand is. You know, he's the eye doctor. He's the optics guy. He's the go outside and stare at the sun, but not directly at the sun guy. But he's just kind of mashed that into a coffee protocol. But again, given absolutely no evidence directly related to his initial assertion, which is related to reducing your afternoon crash. Have you heard a single piece of evidence of anything he stated that's even related to that? No, because he doesn't say anything. He just kind of shoves loads of mechanistic garbage in the middle, distracts you with fancy scientific words. And again, because of his credential and the confidence that he speaks, people just gobble it up like candy. It's insulting. If, however, you were to wake up and immediately drink caffeine, caffeine itself can stimulate the release of cortisol a little bit more than it would otherwise. Not really that small, actually quite in line with the cortisol increases that you've been quoting for the cortisol awakening response. Be present in your system, but by blocking those adenosine receptors and because of the indirect effects of caffeine on the cortisol system, you actually are reducing the clearance of adenosine that would otherwise occur. This is another thing that just did not make any sense to me and I needed to look this up further. So you do get a verifiable cortisol increase from your morning coffee, that's well known. But for some reason that cortisol won't clear out the adenosine, even though he keeps saying the cortisol clears out adenosine. And not only that, but does it inhibit the clearance of the adenosine? Does he state any reason why or how this is happening? No, he's just stating it outright with confidence because it supports his protocol, but it doesn't make any sense. Why does the cortisol increase from caffeine not only not clear out that adenosine, but also blocks it. I can't find any mechanism online that supports anything that he's saying here. If you want to see more of Andrew Huberman overstating neuroscience protocols, then check out my video on dopamine and cold plunging. Check out my neuroscience podcast called The Giant Shoulder, where genuine, real, well-meaning neuroscientists will make generally moderate and conservative claims about the brain because not much is known, but you will learn more about the brain yourself and others. Thank you so much for watching.